Thank you. Thank you so much. It is a great honor to be here. Uh, this is my second year at GIDS, and I'm super excited to be here again. This is a fantastic audience. Look at all you, look at all of you here today. And I have to admit, that's a really tough act to follow. And um, unfortunately, I don't have any magic tricks. I just have some interesting slides and hopefully an interesting story to tell, one that will hopefully resonate with all of you here today. And my primary purpose is to not necessarily educate you, but to energize you and hopefully make you think a little bit bigger about the software profession that we're all in. So the metaphor I use is the concept of teaching elephants to dance. And you'll get a, you'll get a chance to see what that means. But the concept of the elephant does not mean I'm bringing an elephant actually into this room. Um, I know that's disappointing, but maybe I'll have to work on that for the next trick. All right, so let's get started. Hopefully you've heard of this story before about the six blind men and the elephant. And basically, the six blind men and the elephant, they approach the elephant and they see it in their own unique perspective. Each blind man you know, touches the elephant and says, oh, this might be a snake, this might be a tree, this might be a wall, this might be a rope. And that's because they don't have the greater context, they don't have the greater perspective. And this happens to us all the time as software people. Whenever we're evaluating a new project, looking at a new problem, evaluating a new technology, Often we don't have enough perspective, enough context, and that's really what I would encourage you guys to think about today, and we're going to kind of focus on in this presentation, to kind of give you guys a high level, uh, a new high level area of context, a new set of uh, parameters, if you will, for you guys to think about problems maybe a little bit differently. All right? So where, you, where you're standing from and what you see is going to be unique to you in all cases. Your, your truth is going to be different than everyone else's in almost all cases. So keep that in mind as we go here. So here's the developer's reality, okay? The developer does want to know what the elephant in the room is. And I'm telling you here on Java Day today, we do have an elephant in the room. And that's specifically the Java E monolith. This is what we've all been talking about or not talking about, and we've all been very worried about it in this age of microservices. And we're going to kind of talk about that in this session today. But I want to also, I want also to encourage you guys to think about the other elephant in the room. And it has nothing to do with actually the code base that you have and how monolithic it is. It's really about your overburdened, lumbering, siloed organization. The monolithic organization that you work for, the monolithic team that you have composed to build the software that you need to build, that's actually the elephant you need to be concerned about, not necessarily the code base that you're focused on. Okay, so let's keep moving here. You're going to be focusing on these two elements. These are the elephants in the room that we have to talk about today. One thing I want to do is give you a little business context, a little IT context, though. Where have we been for the last several years? And I actually started my journey building software back early in the 80s, right, in the 80s, where we actually built Chewy. I call it Chewy for character user interfaces. You know, VT220, VT100 kind of stuff. Maybe you did 5250, uh, 3270, you know, for block mode terminals. But basically, there were three humans involved in every business transaction, if you guys remember back this far. Basically, a customer, in the case of my plant manager up there, realized they needed some new product from a certain vendor. They needed something. They would call up their enterprise sales rep for that vendor. So that's the, third, uh, the second person you see there with the tie. And that person would basically take down the order on paper, put it on a fax machine, and send the fax to a back office person who would type it into the computer system. It took three humans to run a computer transaction back then. This is how we actually architected our software. This is how we designed our software. In the 90s, we actually introduced the concept of the GUI, the graphical user interface. The idea that a Windows desktop could be, put, or Windows laptop or Windows desktop could be put in the field so the enterprise sales rep, the sales rep who was getting the customer order, could type that in themselves. And we thought we solved a huge problem. We eliminated the back office person because now we could do things in the front office. Then in the 00s, right, the early 2000s, we invented this, we started building out the web technology and the customer could self-service. This was a massive inflection point for all of us within this storyline, within this concept of the journey that we're on because now customers use our software, not employees. These, in the case of employees, they had to suck up whatever crappy software we gave them, right? And we, we could blame it on training, we'd blame it on quality, we basically could put anything we wanted in production and the employees would have to deal with it because they worked for our company. Once we moved into the world where customers touched the software, we had to actually build vastly better software. And then now in the world of mobile, right, the user is no longer tied to a desktop themselves, that customer may be actually walking around inside his or her plant, taking orders in real time, and in the future, going forward, if you actually saw my IoT presentation from last year, you need no more humans any longer. 
right? These systems could talk to other systems through different sensors and actually put the orders in directly. So this is the journey that we're on over the last several decades, and we'll continue to be focusing on this for a while longer. So let me tell you about this concept of digital transformation. Okay, you kind of seen the digital transformation journey in that last slide, but right now we're actually undergoing a massive sea change in our, in our IT organization within the world at large. By 2020, every business will be digital predator or digital prey. I have a lot of statistics on this, but we're going to just go through them quickly. There's a survey done by MIT Sloan that said 87% of surveyed executives feel that digital technologies will disrupt their industry. So 87% feel they will be disrupted, yet only 44 are taking action to be prepared for that. We go from 87 to 44, yet only 11% feel they have the in-house talent to do so. They're talking about us in this room right now. We're that 11%. The good news is you guys represent, you know, the, the thousand or so people here represent hundreds of thousands of professional softwares in this city alone. This is one of the most vibrant cities in the, all of the world when it comes to IT talent. So you are part of the 11% just by the fact that you're very much here. As Michael said in his presentation, you guys are a self-selecting audience. You chose to be here to learn something new and you actually gain greater knowledge and greater skill. That does say something about you right away. But think about all your brothers and sisters back at the office who didn't show up today. We've got to encourage them to move down this path also. Let's keep moving. Every, technology, every business is going to be a technology business going forward. You guys hear this a lot. This is what software looks like today. Software delivery looks like this. We have a, an amorphous blob of people pushing this thing uphill, trying to get it over into production, yet there's other people that seem to be standing in the way or holding us down. We don't want to say it's the architecture team or the operations team. <laughs> Maybe it's the DBAs that are you know, holding us back. But here's the problem with this process. Once you overcome the first hill and you finally deliver that software in nine months, you deliver it in 12 months, you got it in production in, in six months, you have to do it again and again and again. So don't you want to make this process even smoother? Don't you want to make software development look more like this, where everybody is pushing in the same direction? We have a small, cohesive unit of software that we're going to deliver well, OK, and at a frequent increments. So high-performing organizations pretty much have, uh, if you actually look at this Puppet Lab survey, that's where I got this data, they're outperforming their peers by 200 times, 200 times more deployments that they're doing. They're not deploying every six months. They're deploying every week. They're perhaps deploying every day. As a matter of fact, they have 2,555 shorter lead times than their competitors. Can you imagine how much faster your organization could improve and learn if you could have this level of speed? And that's really what this pur the purpose of this presentation is about, how to go faster and how to do it better. Because your code offers no value until it lands in production. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you write software, the fact that you can pilot and check it in is not good enough. And I think we've actually done a disservice to software developers over the last several years, where all they had to do was compile it and check it in, and then see the CI run, and then they never actually saw it really run. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, this is the journey we're all on. This, this is my perception of the journey. We've got to start with DevOps. We've got to talk about self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure, automation, and CICD. I have a lot of content in this presentation, but we don't have a lot of time, so we'll keep moving. But these are the different steps you're on before you get to microservices land. Most people want to shortcut this. They want to jump directly into microservices, and they will hurt themselves, and you will suffer great pain if you don't do these other things and these prerequisites. So let's talk about reorganization of DevOps, because here's our reality. Here's the developer on 445 on Friday afternoon. They think they can check their code in. They got it to compile. They checked it in. They don't really know if it really runs. Maybe they ran some unit tests, but you know, the integration tests are run by the CI system. The ops person has to be there all weekend to figure out how to make that piece of junk run. Okay? And that may sound kind of crazy, but this is the reality we live in in many cases today. You have no more accountability for some reason as developers to understand if your stuff runs in production anymore, and that is a problem. You have to know that it really does run in production. You should actually babysit it in production, and you should be on the pager and be called if it fails in production. Because I guarantee you this, because when I managed engineering teams, I, only had, I, only, I used to manage engineering teams, and I specifically would pull in all the development team to fix bugs on Saturday if there were that many bugs the customer was unhappy about on Friday. We only had to do that two or three Saturdays, by the way. And then from that point forward, all the bugs were fixed by Friday. OK? So when you make people accountable, they build better software. That's really the point of this. OK? 
So if you think of this wall of confusion, if you're familiar with DevOps, the concept of the developer throwing it over the wall to the operations team is no longer appropriate. We are now working together, okay? But there's more than just dev and ops in this picture. There's dev, the security team, the DBAs, the business people, the QA people, right? They're all involved with this. They're all involved with this, and here's the thing you should keep in mind. We have to build common ground with these people. I get this question a lot. They're like, Burr, you don't understand. The DBAs will never work with us, right? The operations team is so backwards, they won't work with us. The QA people are so waterfall oriented, it takes them four weeks to do anything at this point, right? Keep in mind you can have common ground with all these people, and that's how you should actually take these folks to lunch, you should actually figure out what their common interests are. That QA person, right? The QA manager, she loves Harry Potter too, as you just saw in the previous presentation, right? They will actually work with you if you will work with them. And so it starts looking like this going forward, hopefully. We're all geeks at that point. Okay? Now, let's talk quickly about self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure. Here's a simple test for your organization. If it takes three weeks to get a new virtual machine uh, configured and provisioned the way you need it, that is a problem. You're an expensive resource. You should not be waiting right, for a cheap resource like a virtual machine, yet we all do. Big organizations take somewhere between three weeks to six weeks to provision a VM. I get that on a regular basis when I don't talk to people about it. That's a problem, it should be self-service on demand, okay? No ticket requirement, you simply use an API and you request that resource. It works this way in the public cloud today, it can work this way in a private cloud today as well. This technology's been there, done that, we know how to do this already, your organization has to decide to adopt it. You also should be thinking in terms of automation, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Kubernetes. I do put Kubernetes in that list, because if you use Kubernetes properly, you can use it to orchestrate our computers and provision all of those, or you can still use things like Ansible, Puppet, or Chef to actually provision actual raw hardware or virtual machines. Also great, very great tools. You should consider the use of Docker in everything that you do going forward, Docker Linux containers, because this allows you to bundle up your application nicely in a nice package and make it easily deployable across the finish line, moving it through a deployment pipeline. This makes it package friendly. You can build your application, know exactly what your parameters are going to be for running that application, the Java virtual machine, the data source configuration, the version of the JWC driver, right? And you won't get those forward and backward slashes mixed up anymore when you build on Windows and you deploy on Linux, as an example. So do consider that. Do learn about these advanced deployment pipelines. So there's a lot to say about CI, CD. These are Jez Humble's test about CI. I want you guys to think about these tests. It's real simple, right? Your software and trunk is always deployable, always ready for production. Very few people actually pass that test. And then some of you who do are like, no, our, my trunk is always ready for production. Well, everyone who has access to that repo needs to be able to check in every day. And you're like, oh no, my developers can't check in, right? They can't actually push the source code. So if everybody can check in every day, per trunk is always ready for production. You know if you actually onboard a new engineer, it only takes a few minutes to onboard that engineer and make them productive, you're practicing great CI, right? You're practicing great uh, continuous delivery practices, things like that. So those are good tests. The, the purpose of the deployment pipeline, again by Jess Humble, is to prove that the release is unreleasable. That's kind of backwards from where we all think, right? We tend to put things over there on the CI system and let it run, and maybe whatever tests get executed, and we assume that it's actually going to ensure that that candidate, right, could be releasable. And in this case, it's to, it's to stop the process, right? To ensure that it doesn't go through the system. So it's a little bit different than how we used to think. Okay, we're almost out of time, but let's finish with this. Uh, well, let's finish with this last big point here. The concept of the deployment pipeline, though, is actually super critical because it has to do a lot with critical vulnerabilities, right? CVEs, right? If, you've, if you guys actually spend any time looking at how software is packaged today, there's, app, there's uh, critical vulnerabilities at the operating system level, at the JVM level, at the uh, framework level, whether it be Spring, Struts, Hibernate, whatever you're using at that level, and any one of these things could be a massive hole, a massive problem for your application, and you need to be able to patch any of those layers within your application, and again, if you use something like Docker, Linux containers, it makes it easier, and you need to be able to produce that, push it through the pipeline and out to production as quickly as possible. The real question here is, do you want to leave a critical vulnerability like shell shock, right, or maybe this JDK one, in production for weeks, if not months, if that's how long it takes you to go to production. And in the case of uh, this JS, uh, sorry, the Struts2 vulnerability, the, it's a zero day vulnerability. The day it became known, the hackers were already in, 
All right, zero day means you have zero time to respond. So how, how long do you want to leave this in production? As a key question you have to ask yourself. So my point with this is going slow could be more problematic than going fast, okay? Now, let's talk quickly about the pipeline. There's the concept of blue-green deployment. You'll see more of this in the presentation later day by Rafael Benavides as an example of a fellow on my team. And the idea that you can actually produce two co copies of the software in production, blue and green, and you can basically modify the load balancer to point back and forth. And in the case of a Kubernetes uh, environment, that's super easy. It's just a simple script that you have to change. And you go back from blue to green and vice versa if there's a bug. You also have the concept of the canary deployment, right? You float a little bit of uh, a little bitty application out to production, a new change to your application, and then route a little bit of traffic to it. And if it survives, you're OK. Right, because the concept of the canary is from the canary in the coal mine. I don't know if you have coal mines here near Bangalore, but in the case of like, let's say Kentucky in the middle of the US, if you actually are digging well under the earth to actually mine coal out of that, uh, you actually might also tap a natural gas line or carbon monoxide can build up inside those caves, inside those uh, mines, and poison all the miners. So they actually used to take a canary in a cage down in the bottom of the mine, and it would sing. And if the canary fell off its perch, they knew they needed to get the hell out of the coal mine. Okay, so that's where the concept of the Canary comes from, and now it's super easy with the concept of a Linux container running through a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, orchestration solution. So, if you do all of these things, if you do all of these things, and we have actually proof, of, we've actually written a story about this and put it up on our blog site, you actually can make your monolithic application, a single code base, a single Java EE code base, monolithic application, deploy as fast as one week increments. <laughs> So we actually took an application from three month deployment increments down to one week using all these things that we talked about here. And that might not seem all that impressive, but if your business needs you to react faster to competitive situations or, react, or, or regulatory changes in inside the environment, the one week interval is super fast, super cool. Now here's one trick with the one week. That's a one week sprint cycle for the engineering team because they're always producing software that's immediately releasable into production. And you can do this even with a traditional Java EE monolith. If you do have other challenges in the microservices category, I would encourage you to read this book. It's available on our website for download. It talks about how to deal with your monolithic database. So strategies for dealing with zero downtime deployments around a monolithic database, how to make that more microservice friendly. So we have a whole book of techniques written for that, uh, for that specifically. Edson Yanaga spoke here at GIDS last year, and this is a piece of work and research he's been doing over the last year, and we published the book recently. I encourage you to get that. Okay, now remember these last key points. These are all the steps you'd have to go through to be ready for microservices. And my point with all of this is you, if, if you do these things, if you reorganize to DevOps and you actually have that attitude and that uh, capability within your organization, you'll be faster. If you have self-service on the land elastic infrastructure and no one's waiting for resources, you'll be faster. If you have great automation where you're practicing uh, Phoenix servers, not snowflakes, no one SSHs into a server and doctors it up anymore, right? A script basically builds a server, builds the Docker image, builds the actual Linux container, you'll be faster. If you actually practice great CICD and a great deployment pipeline and you leverage things like Linux containers and Kubernetes, you will be faster. And then of course you can do things like blue-green deployments and go even faster still, okay? Then you'll be ready for microservices. But here's the key to all of this. It's about helping your digitally transforming organization win, right? You don't want to be digital predator, not digital prey. You don't want to be part of the 47% that are not ready or 44% that are not ready, you want to be part of the 87% who are going to you know, have that need to be digitally transformed. So remember, it's about the organization helping your business win. Okay, Focus on your team. Your team, again, who might look like this. Everybody's involved in producing better software faster, and you all are part of that organization. It's all about lifelong learning, and that's why you're here today to, you to continue to ramp up your skills and actually learn a lot more and always be accountable. You want to own your software in production again. You want to see it run, and I believe we fundamentally remove the joy from programming when we no longer allow the developers to see their code run. You want the metrics to be captured in that production system, both business metrics and technical metrics. You want to get that back into a dashboard like Grafana or Kibana yourself and see that. And then you can know if your software is actually performing as it needs to to solve business needs. Okay, these are the books I'd encourage you to read. If you've not read these books, definitely scan them at minimum. I've read some of them twice in some cases. So you'll want to read The Phoenix Project, The Lean Enterprise, Continuous Delivery, and The DevOps Handbook. 
We are all about bringing more development skill set to the DevOps movement, and I encourage you guys to join it, okay? And this is actually a quote we use all the time within Red Hat. So I work for Red Hat, maybe I should mention that up front, but we use this quote all the time within Red Hat. We talk about this specific Gandhi quote. First, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and at that point, you've already won. And so here's a great photo of that concept. This is actually my CEO standing on a stage with a picture behind him when he basically offered the same quote to the audience. That's Satya, the CEO of Microsoft, the Microsoft that used to basically say Linux was cancer, and now they love Linux, as an example. All right? So thank you so much. Let me give you this right here. If you want access to these slides, and I know many, I get a lot of requests for the slides, email me burrsutterslides at gmail.com. That will give you access to the slides. Also, for those folks who actually go to developers.red.com and register on your phone right now, you get to the thank you page, you go to the Red Hat booth, and we have a few hundred of these special t-shirts we printed just for kids with the elephant with the elephant in the background, so code is my spirit animal. There's a few of those available, and you can get them after our keynote sessions today and over at the Red Hat booth. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>